Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com. Here's an interesting question. Do some composers write music that sounds best the less you do to it? I mean, it's, it really is kind of fascinating. What do interpreters bring to the table? What is an interpretation anyway when it comes to large, complex works? I, I think I was having a discussion, let me put it to you this way, how we got into the topic with my, my good friend and colleague, Christophe Hus, who's music critic for Le Devoir up in Montreal. We were talking about forest fires and smoke and things like that. And one of the things he let fly was, you know, he said, I think, I think that you made a comment that I think had some validity, which was that Nielsen's music sounds best the less you do to it. And I said that myself. I, mean, I, I had said it in a previous video, and he picked up on it, and he said, you know, I think you're kind of right. There are some composers who just don't take well to being futzed with, and Nielsen is certainly one of them. I, I think that this is true. I mean, Nielsen particularly, the reason he doesn't take well to being futzed with is because his music is all about arrival at a goal, about progressive motion, which means it has to move. It has to keep moving. And most of the things that conductors do to music, particularly romantic music, um, is, is most of that stuff is inimical, inimical, inimical. It's, it's uh, deleterious, there we go, to the maintenance of necessary momentum. They play with tempos. They, they emphasize a certain thing, so they have to slow down. They don't accent, they don't take the music at its word when it comes to some of its more alarming features, so they tone it down. I mean, all of those things, they prevent the music from moving. And so anything that prevents Nielsen's music from moving is bad. Anything that keeps it moving is good. <clears throat> and the best way to keep it moving is to do exactly what Nielsen tells you to do and not to try and, and, and interpolate extraneous material. So there you go. Now, I have to say, I have to make a disclaimer. There is always the possibility that a performer will have such a, a performer will have such an idiomatic identification with the composer's style, such a natural feel for it, that they can bring interesting insights that don't get in the way. I mean, that's really sort of a generic description of any great interpretation, isn't it? Fabulous insights that don't get in the way. But Nielsen is one of those guys who it's very easy to get in the way. And so I got to thinking, who, what other composers are there who sound better the less you get in the way? Well, one of them, I mean, perhaps the ultimate one is Bach. Oh my goodness. I mean, Bach is a battleship when it comes to music. Everything is riveted in place and solidly reinforced. Bach is not only performer proof, he's instrument proof, he's timbre proof. He's, he's everything proof. You could play his music underwater, upside down, sideways, backwards. It's always going to come out well because it is so strong in simple, basic musical facts and contrapuntal mastery because everything just fits together. It goes together. I mean, you can do anything with Bach and the evidence is right before us. The transcriptions, the playing things on different instruments, it all works just fine. Handel is just the opposite. Handel needs interpreters. Handel desperately needs interpreters because his music is so much, such such a, a personal appeal to the emotions. Bach's is much more universal in character, if you want to call it that. Handel needs performers who are really getting into it and having a great time and who communicate that to us. The joy of performing the music has to ooze through no matter what he's doing, especially because there's that improvisational element in everything that Handel did. Bach was, of course, one of the world's great improvisers, but his music wrote down just about everything. And throughout history, there's been this tension, hasn't there, between, between what's on the printed page and what the performers do. And the more composers try to take charge by indicating what they want the performers to do, the less the performers have the options of bringing their own creativity to bear, which is usually a good thing in the sense that when the composer is a screaming genius, um, the chance that the performer is going to be equally a screaming genius um, is rather low. And so we do not want non-geniuses mucking about with what the genius did, right? Usually. But I mean, these are gross generalizations. You all understand that, right? So what other composers are there who, 
really don't need help, but unfortunately get it? Well, my big example is Haydn. Haydn is one of those composers. Remember, in those days, if you're orchestral works, maybe you'd get one rehearsal. Things were written to be performer-proof as much as possible, but people still don't play Haydn the way Haydn wants to be played, the way he clearly indicates to be played. I'll never forget the trio of the minuet of Symphony No. 88, where you've got unbelievably differentiated dynamics that until the period instrument people came along and started taking these people at their words, you never heard. You know, the, the general dynamic is piano, the bassoons are fortissimo, the horn comes popping in fortissimo, blah, blah, wah, you know, you never hear these details. Everything was, was, was shunted into a general piece of dynamic sludge that homogenized everything. Haydn is the enemy of homogenization. Mozart, on the other hand, yes, you can homogenize Mozart. Why? Because Mozart is the essential composer of vocal music. Everything he wrote is a singable tune. And so you have to make it sing. And as long as the tune sings, well, yes, of course, there's wonderful stuff happening everywhere. But you can, you can sort of, you know, tamp down the other parts. They're just not as important. What matters is the song. And songs rely on singers. And singers are very personal in their approach to singing. So Mozart can be personalized in a way that, for example, Haydn really can't be. Beethoven was a structural Haydnist, but a composer of the Mozartian expressive ambit. Beethoven invites the performer to give of themselves. That's why he's so popular, number one. But that's particularly true in things like his piano sonatas and his chamber music, where, where it, it's, it's not enough just to play the notes. You have to try and find the more, which is there. You know it's there. You feel that it's there. The question is, do you have the, the, the chops to deliver on what we feel is there? And it's true of Beethoven's orchestral music too. It benefits from people adding a certain extra something to give it that, that cosmic punch that we expect it to have. I mean, that's another example. All of this comes from our conversation about Nielsen. You know, one of the great ironies is that the ultimate, the ultimate non-interference composer probably was Stravinsky, who said that music expressed nothing and it should all just be played exactly as it's on the printed page. But then you listen to the interpretations, you listen to the recordings, and you find that's not what's happening at all. It wasn't what happened when Stravinsky played it. Part of it was realizing what it was possible to ask the players to do, and to what degree you could ask them to do it. But his music is just as amenable to interpretation as anyone else's. And it does sound best when you do what's on the page. But Stravinsky has the problem of, you know, will they do it or won't they? Do they understand what he's asking them to do? Do they get the idiom? I mean, all of these things come into play. One of my most fascinating examples of this sort of tendency is Mahler, because Mahler should be performer proof. It practically is when you think about it. I mean, the music is so over the top, it always makes an impression. But one of the great myths about Mahler is that, is that for example, that Leonard Bernstein overinterpreted, that he was too emotional, that he exaggerated too much. He didn't. He was one of the most faithful of all Mahlerian interpreters. If you look at what Mahler asks you to do, and then look at what he actually did. He was one of the very few who would take Mahler where he wanted to go, to the limit. As with Nielsen, actually. I mean, Bernstein was that kind of guy. That's why he was so great with Haydn and so great with Nielsen. Because he had, he had faith in the composer, faith in what the composer did. And so this myth that Bernstein's Mahler is all over the place and hard on sleeve, and it's, it's, it's wrong. It's just wrong completely wrong. On the other hand, on the other hand, you take a composer like Bruckner, Bruckner needs interpreters. If you just play what Bruckner wrote, just look at it, just play it straight through, and people do, you get nothing. You get absolutely nothing because Bruckner was a very spiritual composer. He was out for the mysterious message of the great beyond and all of that stuff was out there, right? And so Bruckner needs performers who understand the idiom. 
they have to understand what the music wants to do and where it's going. And they have to understand the fact that these pauses mean something, that the repetition means something, that these sound blocks, that the unique construction has to happen in a certain way. It requires sympathetic interpretation. In many, many respects, sympathetic interpretation. But yet there are many conductors out there who play Bruckner in an unsympathetic interpretation. They know they have to interpret, but they don't know how. Or they don't, they don't understand where the music wants to go and what it wants to do. Now, again, these are all very, very generalized comments. But I think it's an interesting question. I really do. It's particularly an interesting question as you know, music goes on into the Romantic period and composers became more and more detailed in how they marked their scores because some of them really, really, really seem to want to take total control while others are taking total control but still saying to the interpreter, oh, please, I need you. I need you desperately. I wonder if you have some ideas about this, about who the composers who sound better without interpreters are or who really desperately need interpreters or who are faking it and claiming that they don't need interpreters, but it's really just insecurity and they desperately want them. I mean, there's all, every nuance in between. Very, very, very interesting topic. I mean, think of Chopin. Chopin needs interpreters. Can you imagine playing Chopin just metronomically without having some rubato, some something, some phrasing? Some, I mean, can you imagine such a thing? There's a guy who wants interpreters, but... On the other hand, there's a guy who is often ignored by his interpreters. What he plainly stated he just goes by the wayside because interpreters feel they have a right to interpret first and learn the text second, which is a common and terrible mistake. So I'm very interested to hear your points of view on this endlessly fascinating topic. Keep on listening, friends. Take care.